Hi, all my precious Whoppers. Um, so we are here today to start going over some of your packets that you've been assigned. Um, so these are to hopefully help with the AP exam to get you the information that you need to know. Um, the first one we're going to go over is the Unit Zero packet. So this one. Um, Pretty this, large. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a big one. But um, it, And now that we know a little bit more about the AP exam, this one won't be as useful. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, um, but the, the information there could possibly help you with developing context for your essay. If they were to give you a DBQ from, um, the earlier sections of the course, it could help you with the sourcing. If there's a document, um, that EBD. could, you know, potentially relate to religion or trade or something like that. Um, it could help you with EBD. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the information here is still important. Um, so we're just going to go through and I'm going to kind of talk through the packet. Um, Curdy Cakes is here to help. <laughs> and, uh, we are going to, um, just kind of go through the answers with you. So that way you'll have accurate information in front of you on the day of the AP exam. Right. So, um, for my students, I'm not sure if Mr. Chisholm has a policy yet, but for my students, um, I am taking a grade on this, but it is completely and totally participation grade. Yep, so all you need to do is figure out a way to get your completed packet um, to me. I think uh, most people that have shared it already with me have just taken pictures and sent them through Teams, and that is completely and totally fine. If you have any other way that you'd like to go through it, then um, I, I'm only taking it for a grade because I have to. <laughs> so... Um, just figure out a way to let me see it and yeah. I'll give you that. Take a picture. You can, uh, I've made it editable, um, to where you can go into the word document and actually edit the word document. Um, so if you wanted to submit it that way, you could um, just type the answers up. You could. Into a word it's hard document. for the pictures for like the graphs and stuff yeah. like that to draw the trade routes or whatever. So I would personally recommend you just taking pictures of the packet. I think that's the best way to yeah. do it. If you can't get it printed, then of course, you know, we'll just kind of work with it, but um, Realistically, we really want you to have these printed because on the day of the AP exam, if you want to refer back to these, you're not going to be able to do that with your computer if you're taking your exam on the right. computer. So having a physical <clears throat> copy is the only way you're actually going to be able to reference these on the day of the AP exam, which is what we want as our end goal. So if you're unable to print them, then you may be able to get in contact with the stool school and see if you can pick up a printed version. Yeah. Anyway, so um, the beginning of the packet starts with a timeline. That's just for reference. That's so just information for you. Mm -hmm. And then it goes through what's called the key concepts. That's actually not a format that College Board uses um, anymore, but it's still Useful. all the information that College Board still uses. Um, but basically, it's broken up into big chunks of information. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the first one is big geography and the peopling of the earth. The first question that you're asked to answer is, um, where did humans first originate? And the answer to that is Africa. That's an anthropological theory. The out of Africa theory is what it's called, that all human beings originated in Africa, and then eventually we spread all over the globe. Right. Um, the next the next section, it's like a little chart for you, mm -hmm. and it's asking what diverse and sophisticated tools were developed by humans to adapt to their new environment. So the two examples that you're given are fire and weapons, and it asks you to tell me what the purpose of those are. So with fire, fire is going to be used for, of course, light. It's going to be used for communication. It's going to be used to support social gatherings. And then obviously it's also going to be used for like cooking. And this is going to be part of the Paleolithic revolution. Mm -hmm. So the old stone being used, um, you know, basic kind of hunting and defense skills um, that would be established, uh, you know, before the Neolithic revolution, before the advent of agriculture. Um, and we start to see like the clustering of uh, river valley civilization. So that's before that. All right, so, um, you know, yeah, and I have a little note down here. The Paleolithic era was characterized by simple tools and nomadic groups of people who hunted and foraged for food. So that's right. like the first sort of phase of human civilization. Hunter gatherers. Is human existence is going to be those hunter gatherers that were nomadic and they used those very simple stone tools. Yep. All right, so um, the next chunk of information, the next key concept is about the Neolithic Revolution and early agricultural society. So about 10,000 years ago is when you have the Neolithic Revolution occur, and that's 
just kind of this very um, gradual shift from where people were hunter hunter gatherers to where they're now going to be um, discovering agriculture, figuring out that they can actually control their food source. Um, so we have a map. <laughs> And um, it just says basically like match the civilization, or not civilization, I'm sorry, the agricultural settlement to its location. Um, that's difficult for me to describe. <laughs> yeah, you can see it. Okay, um, can, yeah, basically, it we have as many listed as you would ever need. Um, but those civilizations are going to be kind of uh, the first to see that uh, wave of uh, the Neolithic, Neolithic Revolution um, kind of uh, control their society in a way to make them into these like river valley civilizations based off of agriculture and irrigation um so we have in like where the area of like where mexico would be today for instance right. in central america that is our mesoamerican hub of agriculture you also have in south america where like peru is today the, the um andean uh civilization civilizations that are going to develop that's another hub of agriculture over in Africa, you have in North Africa, which is going to be like where Egypt is. That's the Nile, and that's going to be a source of agriculture. And then in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is just going to be the lower half of Africa. You're also going to have several little hubs of mm -hmm. um, agriculture developed. In the Middle East, you're going to have kind of like next to Saudi Arabia, the area of um, Mesopotamia. Present day area. Mm -hmm. Um, and then over in India, kind of, uh, it was sort of Northwest. where India and Pakistan um, share a border almost, is going to be where you have the Indus River Valley civilization. Um, and then over in China, kind of on the, the most eastern side of China, is where you have the uh, Yellow River, um, the first agricultural hub in China and East Asia. And then down towards Australia, but not all the way, there's like an island like right above Australia, and that's Papua New Guinea, and that's going to be another mm -hmm. hub of agriculture as well. So. Uh, when we look at these, uh, you know, kind of different items listed on Part B, uh, then we have to understand domestication, the process of taming or training plants and animals to thrive. Um, so in these new agricultural um, kind of hubs, you're going to start to see that process of domestication taking place um, to establish a permanent population. Um, so agriculture, let's go ahead and define that. That's the deliberate domestication of plants and animals. Uh, and then irrigation is going to be the application of water um, to crops, basically creating systems of replenishing crops with water. Um, that's why the river is going to be really important to these civilizations is because they're going to use the rivers for um, a water source to basically um, water their crops. Um, okay, so let's look. Mesopotamia, we would have wheat listed here. Um, the Nile River Valley would be wheat as well. So these are what's called staple crops. And that means that um, if that one crop is going to, to really sustain a large amount of the population. So they're going to really kind of specialize in this one crop. And yes, there will be some diversification right. um, based on like what's locally available. But this is going to be their staple crop. Right. This is like the main thing that they ate. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is going to be yams. Um, again, something that's high in caloric intake, something that can sustain a large population. The Indus River Valley is going to be barley. Um, the Yellow River Valley is going to be rice. Remember in China, that's going to be kind of a staple crop there. Uh, Papua New Guinea is going to be bananas. It's actually where bananas originated. And then you would see the shift later on into uh, parts of East Africa as well. And uh, the Bantu migrations is going to help spread that. Um, Mesoamerica would be maize or corn. Um, and then the Andean mountain region or the Andes would be potatoes. Remember, before the Colombian exchange, you don't have potatoes in Ireland. Um, they're going to be isolated to South America. What effect did agriculture have on the environment? Um, it's going to put a strain on the environment because of more people. Basically, you're going to need more food and you're going to have to alter your environment more to, you know, kind of make up for that um, gap in between civilization, like the population numbers and the amount of food that they need to sustain the population. So you're going to look for kind of ways to not have to change the land so much. Uh, you would see certain crops used because they, um, have a higher caloric intake, um, and maybe need less land or, um, you know, in certain situations like with potatoes, these systems aren't going to take highly skilled labor forces. Basically, um, you're going to be able to, uh, have a large output of crops. Um, for a larger or growing population. And that's something, that's a conversation I have a lot in uh, human geography when we talk about agriculture. Yeah. It's the fact that like a lot of people think that, oh, um, it's agriculture, it's growing plants and, you know, food and stuff. It's it's natural. Like how could that have an effect on the environment? 
Um, but agriculture is not natural. Um, that's actually part of the definition of agriculture is that you are changing the landscape for this process. And so anytime you're growing food, if it's not where it's naturally grown, like we were just talking about how bananas are gonna spread to East Africa through trade, that is still um, deliberately changing that landscape whenever right. you have these crops that are going to be grown in different places. And so that's gonna put strain on that environment. If that's not naturally where that crop grows, then that's definitely going to, to require some um, excess strain on the land. And with these new agriculturally based societies, you're gonna have um, different kind of roles and jobs kind of develop um, as a result of uh, you know an ag agrarian society or an agricultural based society. Um, so an example of this would be like pastoralism. It says define pastoralism. It's a lifestyle in which humans hurt animals. Um, and obviously that's gonna go along with the domestication of flora and fauna or plants and animals. Um, My favorite way to think about pastoralism is like an alternative to agriculture, where it's like with agriculture, um, or not really agriculture, but uh, an alternative to like hunting and gathering, whereas mm -hmm. like with hunting and gathering, you, the human is following the food source and with pastoralism, the food source is following the human. Okay. Um, what impact did overgrazing have on Afro-Eurasian lands? That's going to be desertification. So, um, with, uh, overgrazing, you're going to see that as a theme of pastoralism because it has the most land use. Um, for any type of agriculture that we'll look at. And if you remember from AP Human, uh, we talked about that with the 11 different types of agriculture, but uh, desertification is gonna take place when you have that overgrazing um, of the land or overgrazing of crops, all right? So as we see this shift from, uh, you know, kind of hunting and gathering societies transitioning into agrarian societies, you would see uh, social inequalities, you would see kind of uh, uh, new hierarchies start to form and uh, different relationships kind of being embraced like patriarchy. Um, so with patriarchy, you're going to have a society which is basically like men are considered to be superior and women are less valued. And this sense of like agricultural work dictating society kind of ties in here when we look at patriarchy because uh, the men are going to be the ones tending to the crops, whereas you would see uh, new gender roles develop for women and staying inside the home and basically rearing children. So the next um, key concept or chunk of information is about um, early societies. So where were early societies actually developed? Um, it gives you a little chart here and it's just asking for like um, what developed where. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Mesopotamia developed um, where like Iraq is today. So in Sumer. the Middle East, <laughs> the Nile River Valley um, that's going to be a, an early society that developed in Egypt, like in northern Africa. Um, the Indus River Valley is going to be an early society that developed in India, kind of where India Pakistan is today. Um, the Yellow River Valley is an early civilization in China, like where we think of China today, in East Asia. Mesoamerica, that's going to be a hub for, um, you know, several different early societies when we look at like the, the Mexica, the... Um, Olmec, the uh, Mayan eventually, eventually the Aztecs. Mm -hmm. Mesoamerica is kind of that area between um, basically like where Mexico mm -hmm. is all the way down to where South America starts. So Meso actually means middle. Right. And so it's like the middle of the two Americas, North and South. So it's like we think of chunk. Central America if you look yeah. back to the AP regions, right? And then the last one is the Andes. So the Andes is going to be a hub of civilization for one that's called Norte Chico very mm -hmm. early on. The Inca. And then um, later it'll be the, the Inca. Yep. Okay, so um, early states were often led by a ruler who is believed to have divine support or supported who is supported by the military. Um, so for each of these civilizations, they want you to explain how their ruler justified their power. Mm -hmm. So um, for China, um, which the, the earliest civilizations of China, when you look at the, the Shah, which is like probably not you know, <laughs> a thing, <laughs> like that's pro a made up dynasty. Um, then the Shang. <laughs> no Chinese students should watch this. <laughs> the, the Shang is like the fantasy dynasty they to give the Shang yeah, somewhere to come from. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so the earliest Chinese dynasties are going to use um, what's called the Mandate of Heaven. And the Mandate of Heaven is going to be basically this widespread um, belief, this doctrine that is going to, to state that the power is given to those dynastic rulers by the gods. Mm -hmm. And um, China wasn't even like a particularly religious 
uh, hub. Like there, there wasn't really one unifying religion in the area, but there was kind of this uh, agreement upon higher powers. And so there was the idea of like the gods gave this position of leadership to the dynastic ruler. And then um, the dynastic ruler has to maintain that relationship that they have to please the gods. They have to um, take care of their people. They have to do the right thing. And if they don't, then the people mandate can... of heaven will be taken away from them. And a result of that will be things like famine and uh, peasant revolts and um, their dynasty crashing. And so they justified the rise and fall of what's called the dynastic cycle um, with like, oh, well, the dynasty's falling. They must have lo lost the mandate of heaven. We should replace them now. And so realistically, that's going to devolve into civil conflict and civil war. Um, you can make comparisons when you look at the Egyptian civilization using the divine right of kings as justifying um, kind of Pharaoh's rule over the Egyptian populations. Um, very similar to that mandate of heaven that we talked about as well. Um, and then later on, you would start to see a shift away from, you know, divine authority to, uh, you know, the populace. People basically deciding when it's time for a government to be replaced. Um, and then eventually people deciding, you know, who they want in power, what kind of government, that kind of thing. Um, so we'll talk about that later, but that's just a connection that you can kind of make um, as society transitions to, um, you know, that shift later on. In Mesopotamia or uh, Sumer, city-states started to develop. Um, Mesopotamia was city-states. So they had several rulers. So like Hammurabi. Right, yeah, he was mm -hmm. uh, in charge of Babylon. Mm -hmm. um, so in Egypt they believed that their kings were actually gods, like they were divine themselves. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Mesopotamia, the gods were a much more um, like scary, sort of mysterious. Disaster kind of, based. Yeah, like their their gods were, were much less connected to humans. And so they didn't see their kings as gods themselves, but they saw them as representatives, exactly. Yep. Okay, so the next part uh, says the states grew and competed for land resources uh, the more favorably suited, including the Hittites, um, who had access to iron, had greater access to resources, uh, produced more surplus of food, and experienced growing populations. So explain how having greater access to resources, food, and population growth led to states uh, taking over surrounding territories and states. Territory. Okay, so a, a way that we could see, uh, you know, this having uh, an effect with the access to resources and food the populations that are going to have, uh, you know, their established agricultural societies are going to have more food to feed their people, which leads, uh, you know, to basically more people, um, people living into sexual maturity and repopulating. Um, and essentially that's going to lead to uh, exponential growth of their population versus people who have less access to uh, sustainable agriculture or something that is, uh, you know, not just seasonal, um, but can sustain a population. All right. So um, moving into culture. So culture is going to play a significant role in unifying states because, um, I mean, culture goes along with law, art, architecture, all of that can kind of play a role in what an uh, area's culture looks like. Um, so some examples that we have listed here, it's on page five of the packet, um, pyramids and the terracotta army. These are just two examples of monumental architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's going to kind of reflect the culture of the area. So the first one is the pyramids. Um, it was created in Egypt. Um, the approximately when it was created date would be about 2500 BCE. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the pyramids are going to be to be the um, burial place of the Egyptian kings. And this shows another way to legitimize power and control over society. Uh, the terracotta army, uh, what civilization, this is gonna be the Chen in China. Um, and approximately 200 BCE, um, and then the purpose is going to be basically to protect Shi Wangdi um, in the afterlife. And it's also kind of a status symbol of his uh, kind of importance to the Qin power. dynasty, his power. All right. So um, looking down there, it has just a lot of kind of information for you. Um, the next question that it asks is about the Code of Hammurabi. Um, so the Code of Hammurabi is going to be one of the world's first like legal codes that's going to be developed. Um, and uh, it asks, what are some aspects about Hammurabi's code that show that it was an example of a developed legal code that reflected existing hierarchies and facilitated the 
rule of governments over people. So some examples of this is that it has very, very strict rules. If you remember going over the Code of Hammurabi, mm -hmm. um, it's got like every possible scenario kind of laid out and exactly, theft. <laughs> exactly what's going to happen in all of those scenarios. Mm -hmm. So very strict rules and very harsh punishments. This is going to be where we have that phrase, an eye for an eye come from. Right. Um, because the idea of um, disobeying or causing any kind of societal disruption it needed to be um, sort of stomped out immediately. And as you see society start to expand and kind of grow beyond their early boundaries, then you're going to see the need for um, some way to kind of uh, socially stratify laws, but also a, a way to have like a, a codified form of um, laws where you can see, you know, multiple situations and how they're going to be um, punished or reinforce that sense of like control. Yeah, and that's how it also reflects hierarchy, too, mm -hmm. is that the punishments that are given are different based on who did the crime. Right. So if a woman does something, she gets one punishment, whereas if a an enslaved man does something, he gets a different punishment, whereas if a free man does something, he gets a different punishment. So it has those social... Um, Things. Yeah, the, the social stratification mm -hmm. built into the actual law codes. Reinforcement of patriarchy, yeah. Okay. Moving on to our next section, Key Concept 2.1. Um, this talks about the further developments of religious traditions um, and how it gave people a common bond and an ethical code to live by. Um, so the first uh, portion, Part A, talks about how Jews were conquered by various groups, the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Roman empires, at different times throughout world history, um, which is going to cause the Jewish diasporic communities to kind of emerge around the Mediterranean region and the Middle East. So uh, we first need to look at what a diaspora is, and it literally means to disperse. Um, and this is the spread of any cultural group outside of their homeland. And specifically in world history, we typically refer to uh, the diasporas as Jewish populations throughout the world, uh, because we are going to see them without a homeland for so long. Um, but it can be any cultural group um, that's living outside of their homeland. So the core beliefs outlined in the Sanskrit scriptures uh, form the basis for the Vedic religions, which we kind of later recognize as Hinduism. So uh, what we're going to do in this next section is just kind of define or explain the following core beliefs of Hinduism. Um, so the first thing is Brahma is the overarching divine entity in Hinduism. Right, so our next term, reincarnation, ties right into the caste system as well, but this is known as samsara, the cycle of birth and rebirth. Um, so as you fulfill your duty in life or your dharma, um, you're going to be reincarnated based off of uh, the fulfillment of that duty. Uh, the caste system obviously ties into all of this, uh, where you have a different caste in societies that have different roles in their lives um, that they should fulfill. So that's going to be, um, you know, if you remember the figure that we drew and color coded at the beginning of the year, um, it would have the different parts of the body that were parts of Brahma that broke up the Hindu um, population into different castes. Um, so they're going to have different roles. You have like the Brahmin. Um, those are going to be the uh, voices of God or the speakers for God. Uh, the second is going to be the Kshatriyas. And those are going to be basically representative of the shoulders or arms. So think strong, right? These are going to be your warriors. Um, and then we have the Vaisyas, which are like your legs, the thighs, the people who keep stuff moving. Um, that would be like the merchant class. Okay, last, we have the Shudras. And that's going to be basically day laborers, people working in agriculture. Um, and the placement in the Hindu uh, society, in the Hindu caste system, is going to be prescribed at birth. And you're going to have the use of the caste system by states to help regulate their society and legitimize um, their power and why certain people should be a part of, you know, the warrior class and how they, that even though they're going to die, right, they're dying on a battlefield based off of like fulfilling their duty or their dharma so that they can be reincarnated into a higher caste. So that's going to help legitimize state control. So we have a chart here about Buddhism. Um, the first uh, square that you have to fill in asks if it's mono or polytheistic. And with Buddhism, that's a little bit complicated because um, the original intent of Buddhism was just to be not really a religion, but kind of a lifestyle and an additional sort of source of um, comfort and fulfillment. Um, in addition to religion. So realistically, the the basis of Buddhism was that you could be any religion. Mm -hmm. um, you could be 
Hindu and polytheistic and still practice Buddhism. You could be, um, you know, Christian and monotheistic and still practice Buddhism. So that was the original kind of idea of it. However, over time, then Buddhism has developed into uh, a religion where you do have Buddha recognized as a god. So realistically, the answer to is it mono or poly um, is just, you know, maybe... Who's both, asking? <laughs> both or neither. Who knows? Right. Um, so it just depends. So uh, the key gods within Buddhism, if you are looking at the monotheistic version of Buddhism, then it would be Buddha. Um the Buddha, the enlightened one. Mm -hmm. um, you have... Uh, Siddhartha the, Gautama. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the key figures there below that, Siddhartha Gautama is the kind of founder of Buddhism. He's going to be the first one. He was Hindu. He was a Kshatriya. Um, and he's going to have these experiences in his life to where he ends up um, sort of shifting his mindset to thinking that, you know, why am I... Uh, sort of constricted uh, of what I can and can't do because I'm a Kshatriya. That mm -hmm. that's, that's unfair and that's unreasonable for society to function this way. So Siddhartha Gautama really fought against the caste system. Yeah. Whenever he was developing Buddhism, that was kind of the idea of it, is the way that you could still be fulfilled. You could still achieve your end goal, which in Hinduism was moksha. And, uh, the release. Buddhism, Buddhism is the same exact thing. It's nirvana. But with moksha, you have to you have to fulfill all your castes, and then you have to die. Mm -hmm. Whereas within Buddhism, Siddhartha Gautama said, "No, you can achieve nirvana. You can achieve that fulfillment, that enlightenment in this lifetime. You don't even have to die, much less be reincarnated, um, for you to achieve that end goal." You just have to have in introspection and like uh, self reflection kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. So Buddhism is a reformist religion in that way that it kind of took Hinduism and it changed things. Um, and then eventually it's going to develop its own kind of separate separate religion. To become a large universalizing religion. So, so um, the location is going to be um, India, technically. Ish. Now, today, it's Nepal. Um, but India, if you know South Asia, you're good. Um, the approximate founding is going to be around 600 BCE. Um, the religious text, there's not really like a book that you read, but you do have what's called the Four Noble Truths. And the Eightfold Path, that's mm -hmm. going to be the central kind of core beliefs within um, the uh, religion itself of Buddhism. And then the moral philosophy and the main ideas, um, no caste system. Um, it is going to be more accepting of women because that's one thing that Hinduism wasn't, um, they weren't very accepting of women. <laughs> uh, Patriarchal. <laughs> And um, the way that you're going to be able to achieve that end goal of nirvana is going to be to accept the Four Noble Truths and to follow the Eightfold Path. Mm -hmm. So basically the Four Noble Truths were that all life is suffering, suffering is caused by desire, um, the way to end suffering is to end desire, and the way to end desire is to follow the Eightfold Path, which are just like eight things that you should do, like right mind, um, you know. Right speech. Right speech, mm -hmm. right philosophy it's just like different steps that you take within your life mm -hmm. all right so um with buddhism the way that buddhism is going to spread through south asia this is the next chart here on the next page um ashoka ashoka is a key figure in buddhism um he's a leader within the Mauryan dynasty and uh whenever he gained power in india then uh, you know of course the predominant religion at the time was going to be hinduism and that was what they sort of operated their society off of, but whenever Ashoka took charge, um, he's going to be a Buddhist, and so he's going to spread Buddhism. And um, you know, whenever you look at any kind of diffusion uh, with religion, if you have people in power that are practicing a religion, then people who are not in power want to practice that religion. Right. And so him being in this powerful position of the leader of the Mauryan dynasty and him being a Buddhist, that's automatically going to make people more interested. And then uh, he's going to actually actively spread Buddhism. He's going to set up a lot of stupas, which are like Buddhist temples. He's going to set up um, what he called the pillar edicts, which are going to be like where he would have these really large pillars. A lot of them are still there in India today. Um, and they would actually be inscribed with things like the Four Noble Truths mm -hmm. and the Eightfold Path. And so he was like actively spreading, promoting. yeah, mm -hmm. actively promoting Buddhism throughout um, 
India. And so that's gonna make it see, um, be seen as more like a legitimate religion whenever Ashoka himself was a Buddhist. Um, yeah. Another way that Buddhism is gonna spread through South Asia is gonna be through monasteries. Monasteries are gonna be set up along trade routes, so in particular like the Silk Road. Um, and the monasteries offered a very like attractive lifestyle. The monasteries were a place where you um, could relinquish all of your material possessions and you would be able to live this life of kind of seclusion mm -hmm. and just focus on your religion and focus on praying. And the monastery actually like took care of you. It was kind mm -hmm. of like, you know, a, a home that was set up for these people who wanted to devote themselves completely to Buddhism. And that's going to be very attractive to a lot of people, um, in particular people who were maybe lower caste within Hinduism. That sounded really nice to them. Or women in some areas, you know, like um, within Hinduism or in China with Confucianism, where it's going to be much, much harsher on women. Um, Buddhism was much more open to women. And so being able to come and live in this place, um, that's going to be very, you know, appealing to them. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so next we have uh, the chart on Confucianism. And if we look at theism, it's already got that filled in for you. Uh, it's not a religion, it's a system of ethics. The approximate date that we have here for Confucianism is 500 BCE, uh, the relative location, of course, being China. Um, some key figures or prophets, that would be Confucius. Um, and then the key text would be the Analects. Okay, so those are going to be the reflections of um, you know, people who had been taught by Confucius and um, gave their own kind of takes on what Confucius believed and kind of formed these religious texts for people to follow. Uh, the moral philosophy here, the main idea is basically everyone has a role to play in society and there are five basic relationships. Uh, it's going to help reinforce patriarchy. Um, and it's important to remember with Confucianism and Taoism, the next chart, um, these philosophies were created during a time period in Chinese history called the Warring States period. And basically the entire dynastic system is going to completely and totally crash um, for like 300 years. And so nobody knew exactly how to fix that. Like everybody was just at war, mm -hmm. Warring States period. And so the um, different ideas for how can we fix society um, are going to be things like Confucianism and Taoism. Those are going to be two of the more successful ones. But um, these were all kind of seen as like, this is the way we should live our life in order to achieve social harmony once again, because they were in a time period where everything was very chaotic. All right, so the next chart is about Taoism, which is also going to be a um, Chinese-based uh, religious system. And that's what it says down there in the first box with um, mono or poly. It's not really a religion. It's just a system of beliefs. It's, it's not like anything's really worshipped in this religion. Um, so the key god, I guess you could say, is called Tao, Taoism. Um, the word Tao means like the way. It refers to like the natural way of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, so this is going to be located in China. Um, the key figure in this is called uh, Laozi, which is L-A-O-Z-I. Um, the approximate founding is about 500 BCE, around the same time as Confucianism. Um, the religious text is the Tao Te Ching, which is going to be basically a compilation of Laozi's um, beliefs. And then the moral philosophy and main idea is basically like follow the natural way of the universe. Um, it's a very kind of like laid back religion, um, be it one with nature. Everything was all about uh, how can I as a human being make kind of as little impact as possible. And that if everybody just kind of went with the natural way of the universe, then we'd be able to achieve that social harmony. So we're moving forward with Christianity now. So, wow, how did that happen? All right, let's move on. All right, so the next chart is about Christianity. It's already filled out for you with the major beliefs and the founding and the key figures. All of that's already filled out for you, mm -hmm. so make sure you look over that. Um, the next thing that you have to fill out is the chart where it says um, explain how each of these caused Christianity to spread. Um, so the first one is Emperor Constantine, which is already filled out for you. Constantine was a ruler of the Roman Empire who made Christianity the official religion of the empire. And just as I was saying with Ashoka, um, when you have someone in a position of authority that 
um, believes in a certain religion, other people are going to follow suit. Um, so whenever Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity himself, then that is going to make it a more popular um, sort of viable option within the Roman Empire mm -hmm. that, you know, actually for the first time people could practice being Christian um, because of the fact that it had been um, like illegal for a long time and Christians had to practice uh, in isolation. So right. another way that Christianity is going to spread is through missionaries. Christianity is a universalizing religion. So um, actually spreading the faith is part of the faith. Um, the first Christian missionary is considered to be Paul of Tarsus. He was a Roman citizen, and so he actually had the ability to travel anywhere throughout the Roman Empire. And so wherever he went, he would talk about Christianity. Um, and he's going to kind of be a key figure in spreading that religion throughout Rome itself, along with Constantine. Um, and then as you look forward in history, missionaries are going to make it a goal of theirs. They are, pe they are people who are specifically their their goal and their mission is to spread the religion itself. All right, so the next chart or um, grids that we're going to be looking at are going to be examples of how art and architecture reflected the religious belief systems. Um, and so we talked about how rulers legitimize power through art and architecture. Now we're looking at how religions are going to reinforce their uh, belief systems based off of uh, these forms of art and architecture. So the first one we have is the Great Stupa, um, and the religion associated with this image would be Buddhism. Um, so the style generally has a dome and is surrounded by a fence, and this is going to be a religious site uh, for people who practice Buddhism. It's going to be um, a Buddhist temple. Next we have Angkor Wat, uh, which is going to be associated with Buddhism as well. Um, the style is meant to resemble Mount Meru, home to religious deities. Um, so an interesting thing with Angkor Wat is that it was actually built originally as a Hindu temple, and then later in Cambodia's history it's going to be expanded as a Buddhist um, building. Uh, so the origins of the building are Hindu, but the uh, expansions on the building are Buddhist. Um, which it is also the largest religious building in the world. All right, so next we have um, the Parthenon, which is going to be associated with Greek mythology. Uh, and this style consists of straight lines, tall columns made of stone and symmetry. Um, so this is going to be dedicated to Athena, the goddess of wisdom and warfare. All right, moving on to uh, different belief systems. Basically, it's saying they generally reinforce existing social structures while also offering new roles and status to men and women. Um, so filial piety fits into this because it uh, reinforces that idea of devotion to elders um, and the five key relationships of Confucianism. Um, it also shows that kind of theme of patriarchy uh, here with filial piety because that does play a role um, depending on if you're a male or female. All right, so monasticism is a lifestyle in which someone gives up worldly possessions and pursues to uh, focus on a religious faith or ideology. Um, and that's going to, of course, create these different roles for women in monasteries um, and giving them kind of roles within uh, the religion itself. All right, so the next chart that you're looking at, it's just kind of asking you big questions and it's telling you um, that, you know, you it might be helpful to have like an example for each of these. Um, so one of the big questions that it asks is, is how uh, have religions reinforced existing social structures? So... Um, the, the answer that I put, which, I mean, your answer may look different, but basically just understand that religion shaped early societies, okay? So society and religion went hand in hand when we look at early civilizations. Um, so some examples could be like with the caste system, when we talked about how the caste, um, is kind of like your, your social class, and so that religion and society went hand in hand as well as the Confucian Five Relationships. That was created and enforced um, religiously, but also it was done for social harmony. So it, it really shaped that society in China. How have, how have religions impacted roles and status of men? So um, really the, the biggest thing there is that men have consistently held familial power in all religions. When you look at pretty much every religion across the board, men play a larger, uh, more significant role in the family and in society. So it's really going to reinforce patriarchy there. And even though a lot of the the de developed religions later in history 
Um, like when we look at like Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, they are much more open to women. They are much less patriarchal in a lot of respects. Um, it's still an ongoing theme. It's still like, they, oh yeah, they were better to women, but women still weren't considered equal. So it's going to consistently give men the power. Um, and then how have religions impacted roles and status of women? So with the developments in re religion, then you often have um, improvements to women's status. So an example of that would be like in Buddhism um, and Christianity uh, with the building of monasteries, a lot of them allowed women to participate in the monasteries. So like when you think of monasteries within Christianity, it's typically like monks and nuns. Um, they still allow women to participate. Um, whereas in some religions, like in Hinduism, women weren't even allowed to participate. So that's going to be a new kind of development there. Okay. On page 10, we're starting with uh, other religious and cultural traditions continued parallel uh, to the codified written belief systems and core civilizations. Um, so they have one filled in there for you. Shamanism, a religion that's characterized by belief in an unseen world of gods, demons, and ancestral spirits. Um, animism, we've talked about a little bit in Sub-Saharan Africa, but the belief that plants and animals have spiritual qualities. Um, so think about the tree grandma in Pocahontas. That's going to be, you know, an example of animism um, shown in film. But uh, you, you typically see this uh, persisting in Africa and the Americas. Um, ancestor veneration is the worship and communication with dead ancestors. Another great Disney example of this would be the scene in Mulan. Um, where she's in the kind of temple, I guess, yeah, and, she um, calls upon the and she's ancestors. calling upon her ancestors. And um, what's his name? Mushu. Mushu. <laughs> Mushu has the job of waking them up using the gong. Um, so, anyways, Africa, East Asia, the Andes region, and the Mediterranean uh, would be where it was uh, practiced. Okay. Next, we have key concept two point two: the development of states and empires. Um, so there is a chart. Okay, that we have listed. Um, all that we could fit, uh, basically, uh, the different um, empires and states that would develop during this period. Um, the number and size of key states and empires grew dramatically as rulers imposed political unity on areas where uh, there were originally no competing states. So on the map provided, it just asks you to label um, the key states and empires using different, uh, different colors. But if you want to just circle it and label it, that's fine as well. Um, Southwest Asia it shows the Persian empires, uh, East Asia, the Chin and Han empires. So basically just knowing your uh, geography regions. here and knowing your AP regions is going to help you fill in this chart. Again, if we'll show If there's any it. that you don't know um, what it means when it says South Asia mm -hmm. or, you know, North America or whatever. If there's any that you don't know, of course, um, reference your atlas from your summer assignment that should mm -hmm. be in your binder and also study that because you're going to need to know that that's yeah. very important okay so one last time here for us to see all of the different listed civilizations there all right moving forward so there is another question there but it actually was a chart and i didn't put it in there and it's not important that's why i deleted it um but it was like select a government and explain how um the military power um, developed so just know that I accidentally left the question there so it's like part a Roman numeral two but part a um, this no, ignore that. that so now we're looking at unique social and economic dimensions that developed in imperial societies in Afro Eurasia and in the Americas um, so they have listed here for you corvée uh, slavery rents and tributes peasant communities and family and household production um, so the first column we have or the first row that we have rather uh, is corvée labor um, so this is unpaid, unfree labor uh, for a landlord or a government, and that's going to be used in um, the Andean region in South America, uh, where they're going to use that as a way to uh, build up their uh, kind of economies and infrastructures. Um, a good way to think of corvée is like basically instead of paying taxes, you go and actually do the work. So like in the United States, we pay taxes and that goes, goes towards other people going out and actually building roads and bridges right. and that kind of thing. Whereas with um, this system, then instead of paying taxes, I would go out and actually work for the government for two weeks, filling potholes and doing whatever else. Or harvesting crops or whatever yeah. it may be. Um, the next is the tribute system. You can see a, a stark contrast here. Uh, the Aztecs are actually going to use this to kind of keep autonomy and establish trade. Um, with surrounding states and basically instead of going to war with them they're going to establish trade relations through gifts and protection um, by the Aztecs for those surrounding communities 
to where uh, these gifts can be exchanged for protection, basically, to be a part of the Aztec Empire, so that they can incorporate, um, you know, a vast array of uh, societies with different cultural norms and uh, taboos, things like that. Okay, so you could add in China here as well, um, and just reference the uh, tributary system where they're going to establish uh, trade relations with the Manchus and Mongolians to effectively keep them from invading, um, you know, China and taking over. They're going to have these trade relations to keep them um, civil towards one another. Okay, next we have patriarchy continued to shape gender and family relations in all imperial societies for this period. And it says the Roman, Han, Persian, Mauryan, and Gupta empires encountered political, cultural, and administrative difficulties that they could not manage which eventually led to their uh, decline, collapse, and transformation into successor empires or states. So list the factors that led to the collapses of these uh, you know, falling empires, the Han Dynasty. Um, so again, with China, once you've lost the mandate of heaven, it goes into this kind of competition over who's gonna be in control next, um, known as the Warring States period. Um, you would also have foreign invasions, this is by the nomads from the steppes, um, imperial corruption, and disease outbreaks that would lead to ultimately the Han Dynasty um, collapsing and losing control. Um, and then eventually the Sui would take power. Okay, um, Rome, that basically they got too expansive. They tried to have too large of an empire. Um, and essentially they're gonna break down in communication. Um, you're gonna have local leaders who wanna take control for themselves, competition, uh, foreign invasions, the barbarians, um, and sickness and disease would uh, essentially lead to their demise. So lead poisoning possibly. That's kind um, of a common theory of this outbreak. There's a huge outbreak of sickness towards the end of the Roman Empire um, there in the early 400s. Um, and the idea was that it was possible that the aqueducts that they had built were um, lined with lead. And mm -hmm. so a large percentage of the population actually got lead poisoning. The right. okay, next key concept that you're looking at is dealing with trade, these the emergence of interregional networks of communication and exchange. So we studied trade routes um, early in the year. Uh, so some of the trade routes there, um, the Silk Road, the Trans-Saharan, the Indian Ocean, and they also included the Mediterranean Sea on this chart. Um, so we're just going to go through the chart. So the Silk Road, the climate and location, um, this was located uh, from Rome all the way to China. So it expanded across all of Eurasia. And it's really a network of trade too. That's important to remember. So, um, of course, as far as climate type goes, I, I made sure to mention that it was difficult terrain. It was very mountainous, but um, that's obviously a very uh, varied terrain if you're going all the way from one side of a continent to the other. Mm -hmm. um, the goods that were traded along the Silk Road, obviously silk is going to be a huge one. Um, spices are big. Uh, porcelain from China, that's going to be huge. And a lot of the trade is going to be going from China to Rome and not as much going back to China, because remember China um, was very proud of their self-sufficiency. Um, so the ethnicity of people involved, it's important to remember this was a relay trade, so you actually had different people involved um, on different stretches of the Silk Road, um, but a lot of the merchants on the Silk Road are going to be Indian merchants, as well as um, merchants from the Middle East. All right, the next one is the Trans-Saharan, um, the caravan routes that were there. Uh, the location is going to be in northern Africa, obviously in the Sahara Desert, and the climate is going to be desert. It's hot! <laughs> <laughs> Some of the goods that are going to be traded on the Trans-Saharan routes are going to be uh, gold and salt and slaves. Those are going to be the three biggest, but you also have like exotic animals that are going to be traded. Um, some very luxurious uh, jewelry and precious metals, that kind of thing. Um, the ethnicity of people involved, um, usually it was kind of limited to those people in North Africa. Um, so you have like uh, the uh, Mali and the Songhai Empire that are going to have people involved in this. But you also have a lot of Muslim merchants from the Middle East that came and participated in this as well. And that's actually one way that Islam is going to spread into areas of Africa. Right. The next trade route is the Indian Ocean. So this is obviously going to involve the entire Indian Ocean Basin. Um, so when you look at the regions that are involved, you've got connections in East Africa, you've got connections to the Middle East, you've got connections to India, to East Asia with China, as well as Southeast Asia. Um, so it includes everybody there along the Indian Ocean. Right. Um, the climate is water. Um, so, like, it's important to remember the monsoon winds are going to be a big challenge. Um, the goods that are going to be traded included things like textiles, spices, once again, because India is involved, 
precious metals, tropical fruits, um, and the ethnicity of people involved are going to be Muslim merchants. The Muslims are going to basically own the Indian Ocean during this period of time. Now, why is that that you see so many Muslim merchants kind of going about in the Indian Ocean as, uh, like, you know, choosing their profession to be a merchant? Why do you think that so would be? So, merchantry was a very highly respected profession within the religion of Islam because Muhammad, the founder of Islam, is going to be a merchant originally before he becomes a political leader. The... The Mediterranean Sea is another trade route. Um, it's connected to the Silk Road, so just know that whenever we talk about the Mediterranean Sea, you're talking about that s kind of smaller um, water-based trade between like areas of Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. You know what, let's, just, let's just show them the chart. There yeah. we go. There's the map, and you can see the Mediterranean right there. All right, it's right there in the center. Okay. All right, so some goods that were traded, textiles are going to be really big in the Mediterranean, as well as olive oil, because that's going to be their primary um, crop grown there in the Mediterranean. It's going to be olives. Um, and then art is going to be a huge trade in the Mediterranean as well. Um, the ethnicity of people involved was very, uh, you know, diverse. You had uh, Romans and Greeks, you had the Byzantines that were involved, and you had Northern African merchants as well. Okay. Are we on the last page now? Wow, we made it through this awful Unit Zero packet. So on the last page, we have new technologies basically facilitating long-distance trade and communication. Um, and so it's going to talk about technological advancements towards the end of the period. We're getting closer to 1200, um, where basically the uh, new technologies permitted the use of domesticated pack animals to transport goods across longer trade routes. So like pack animals are going to influence trade by allowing trade to happen through the use of camels in the Saharan desert. If you think about that, um, camels can store water and basically are not going to need as much water throughout their trade routes um, to basically carry out their exchange. Um, and it's also going to dictate how much could be traded based off of what type of animal you're going to be using. Um, so the use of pack animals is going to really influence the uh, quantity uh, of trade and the ability of trade as far as the environment goes. Maritime innovations that would, uh, you know, be kind of crucial for this long distance trade would be, of course, the compass, which would let merchants know what direction they're actually going. Yeah. Astrolabe is going to allow merchants to plot their location based on um, the location of stars and constellations, essentially helping them travel and know which direction they're going um, and basically where they are so they can direct themselves uh, along the trade route. So lateen sails are also going to be used uh, to basically make ships more maneuverable. Think of the three triangular sails that would be used um, during this time period. It would allow them to grow to larger sizes. Basically, they could ship more cargo because um, they had more power using the trade winds uh, and these lateen sails to push them along the trade route. Um, how did a more advanced knowledge of monsoon winds help stimulate trade from Africa to Asia? Well, if you look at this, again, coupled with the Latin sales and the use of, uh, you know, the technological innovation here, uh, merchants are going to use those monsoons to basically predict uh, when they can actually carry goods faster along this trade route. Um, and they're going to use the monsoons to their advantage. They're going to catch these uh, monsoon winds to propel them forward along the trade route. So um, by sailing in patterns with them, it would speed up trade. So the, uh, the next chunk of information here, it says, in addition to goods being traded, an exchange of people, technology, beliefs, food, animals, and diseases also took place. So it asks you to put the following events in order in which they occurred. And your options are decline of empire, spread of disease, and diminished urban populations. So the order that I would put them in that I think makes the most sense is that, number one, you have the spread of disease. So um, that trade is going to result in the uh, continued communication, the continued spreading of germs, and mm -hmm. then people are going to bring those germs back to their places of origin, and that disease is going to spread. Um, that's going to result in a diminished urban population because... Why would that be? Because in urban settings, you have people living in very close quarters. Right. People live a lot more clustered. And so because of that, disease spreads a lot faster, perhaps like New York City. Wow. <laughs> Um, so the spread of disease is going to result in diminished urban populations and having diminished urban populations is going to cause the economy to suffer and it's going to um, eventually cause the decline of empire. So I put that one as number three. Um, the last chart that you have to do for this packet says for each of the religions listed below, explain where they spread to and how they changed during this time period. So it's just important to remember that Religions were constantly changing and shifting, 
and it really did very depend um it really did depend upon where you're looking um, as to how that religion is going to be practiced. So Christianity, for instance, it's going to spread throughout Europe. Um, you're going to see during this time period prior to 1200 that Christianity is going to split into two branches. So you have Eastern Orthodox and um, Catholicism. Catholicism is going to be practiced more in like Western Europe and Eastern Orthodox is going to be practiced more in Eastern Europe. Uh, essentially, the most basic um, division between those two branches of Christianity is disagreements over the authority of the Pope. So that's one way that it's going to change is that people are going to start developing kind of different opinions um, on the structure of the religion itself. Um, and then Buddhism, it is going to uh, spread through trade to China, to Southeast Asia, and the big change that's going to happen with that spread is going to be the development of the Mahayana version of Buddhism, which is um, where you actually have Buddhism as a religion and Buddha is worshipped as a god and people actually go to a temple to worship the Buddha. Um, and so that version of Buddhism is going to develop during this time period because of the spread to other parts of Asia. Right. All right, is that so, it? Oh my goodness, we have That's finished. Yay, Yay we right. did it. So we've done part one of four. Right. <laughs> so luckily for you, though, these next couple of packets will not be quite as crazy. I mean, that um, was us trying to shove all of history up to 1200 into one packet for you to have as a resource. And this was before we knew that they were going to make it a DBQ, before we knew that it was going to not include stuff from, you know, basically everything that we just covered so that's still really really important information and like two years ago the um dbq was on imperialism but there was a document about the hindu caste system so if you have that background information that's going to help you with sourcing that's going right. to help you with ebd it's going to help you with context so um don't think that this is just something you can throw in the trash i would absolutely still save it i would still study it i would still know that information and be ready to use it on exam day you want to be able to make those connections from other historical periods that's really important tying it all together um, religion is a theme that is continuity throughout history um, and Patriarchy if you can, is a continuity right. throughout history. Yeah, so things like that you need to make sure that you're understanding like, okay, you may not need to know every detail about the religious faith or ideology or whatever it may be, but using that information is going to be helpful in your writing. It's going to show complexity. And so those points that are more difficult to get, um, you can possibly attain by knowing, um, you know, history basically. So, okay, that is it for today, guys. We will give you some more updates later in the week on what to expect for the next unit packet. So uh, just make sure that you are participating on Teams. Make sure that you have the next unit packet ready to go. We'll upload that video later to, to tell you all the answers for that one. Right. Um, other than that, I think that's it. So Bye, guys. I love you. Unleash the power of the pyramid.